Chapter Four of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Does the boss let it go at that? Say, I was just thick enough to guess that he would. I was still having that dream a few days later when the boss says to me, "Shorty, you remember that old castle of ours?" You don't think I've been struck with soften of the brain, do you? Says I. That'll be the last thing I forget. What's happened to it? It's mine, says he. Go away, says I. They couldn't force you to take it. I've bought it, says he. I cabled over an offer, and the count has accepted. Going to blow it up, I says. I hope, says he, getting a little red under the eyes, to spend my honeymoon there. That is, if the Princess Padova. The who, says I. Oh, you mean the Lady Brigandess? If the Princess Padova, says he, keeping straight on, doesn't prefer some other place, we sail tomorrow. Then, then, says I, catching my breath, you've done it? It was silly asking him. Why, it stuck out all over his face. I don't know what I said next, but it didn't matter much. He was too far up in the air to hear anything in particular. Just as we shakes hands, though, he passes me an envelope and says, Shorty, I wish you would take this down to my lawyer next Monday morning. It's a little matter I haven't had time to fix up. Sure, says I. I'll tie up any loose ends. And don't forget to give my regards to old Vincenzo. Say, I suppose I'd ought to told him what a mark he'd made of himself, taking a chance with any such wild rose running mate as that. But somehow it seemed all right for him. I couldn't get a view of the boss made it up with any silk-lined city broke girl. I guess Miss Padova was about his style, after all. And I reckon it would take a man like him to manage one of her high-flying kind. Anyway, I'm glad he got her. I was sorry to lose the boss, though. It's me to go back to trainin' four-flush comers again, says I, when he'd gone. And say, I wasn't feelin' gay over the prospect. Some of these mid-artists is nice, decent boys, but then again you'll find others that you can't take much pride in. You see, I've been knocking around for months with someone who was clean all the way through, washed clean, spoke clean, thought clean, and now there was no telling what kind of push I'd fall in with. You've had a peek at training camps, eh? Them rubbers is apt to be a scousy lot. It was the going back to eating with sword swallowers that came hardest, though. I can't stand for a good many things, but when I see a guy loading up his knife for the shovel act, I rubs him off my list. I was going over all this on the way down to the office of that lawyer the boss wanted me to see. I met him a few times, so when I sends in my name, there wasn't any waiting around in the ante room with the office boy. Bring Mr. McCabe right in, says he. Mr. McCabe, mind you. He's one of those wiry, brisk little chaps with X-ray eyes and a voice like a telephone bell. Ah, yes, says he, taking the letter. I know about that. Some stock I was to turn into cash. Franklin, he sings out. Franklin comes in like he'd come through a tube. Bring me Mr. McCabe's bank book. Bank book, says I. I guess you've dipped into the wrong letter file. I don't sport any bank book. Perhaps you didn't yesterday, says he, but today you do. And say, what do you think the boss had gone and done? Opened an account in my name and fatted it up good and sweet as a starter. But he didn't know me anything like that, says I. A difference of opinion, Mr. McCabe, says the lawyer. For services rendered, that was the way his instructions to me read. I sold the stock and made the deposit to your credit. That's all there is to it. Good day. Call again. And the next thing I knew, I was going down in the elevator with me fist gripping that bank book like it was a life raft. First off, I has to go and have a look at the outside of that bank. That's right, snicker. But say, I've had as much dough as that before, only I'd always carry it in a bundle. There's a lot of difference. Every tin horn sport has his bundle, you know, but it's only your real gent that can flash a checkbook. I could feel my chest swelling by the minute. 
Shorty, says I, you've broke into a new class. Now you've got to make good. And how do you suppose I begins? Why, I hires one of these open-faced cabs by the hour and tells the chap up top to take me to Fifth Avenue. I wanted to think, and there ain't any better place for brain exercise than leaning back in a hansom, squinting out over the folding doors. I got pretty near up the plaza before I hooks what I was fishing after. It came sudden, too. It was like this. Whilst I was sparring secretary to the boss, I met up with a lot of his crowd, and some of them had tried the gloves on with me. I didn't go in for slugging their blocks off just to show them I could do it. There's no sense in that unless you're out for a purse. Sparring for points is the best kind of fun, and for an all-round tonic it can't be beat. They liked the way I handled them, and they used to say they wished they could take a dose of that medicine regular, same as the boss did. And that's just the chance I'm going to give them, says I. With that, I heads back to 42nd Street, picks out a vacant floor I'd noticed, and signs a lease. Inside of a week, I has the place fixed up with mat, chest weights, and such, lays on a stock of soft gloves, buys a medicine ball or two, gets me some cards printed, and has me name done in gold letters on the ground glass. Boxing instructor? Not in your accident policy. Nor private gym, either. Professor McCabe's Studio of Physical Culture. That's the way the door plate reads. It may be a bluff, but it scares off the cheap mugs that would hang around a boxing school. They don't know what it means any more than if it was Chinese. Well, when I gets things all in shape, I gives out word to some of those gents, and before I'd been running a fortnight, I'd booked business enough to see that I'd struck it right. What's the use monkeying with comers when you can take on men that's made their pile? They're a high-tone lot, too, and they don't care what it costs, so long as I keeps them in shape. Some of them don't put on the mitts at all, but most of them wakes up to that. Now there was Mr. Gordon. Sure, Pyramid Gordon. But I'll have to tell you about the game he stacks me up against. I'd had him as a regular for about a month, Mondays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, from five to six. And he was just getting so he knew what real living was when something breaks loose down on the street that makes him forget everything but the figures on the tape. So he quits training. About ten days later, he drops in one afternoon, with fur on his tongue, and his eyes looking like a couple of cold fried eggs. "'Are you coming or going, Mr. Gordon?' says I. "'Where, Shorty?' says he. "'Hospital,' says I. He grinned a little, the kind of grin a fellow wears when he's being helped to his corner, after the count. "'I know,' says he. "'But when you've been sitting for two weeks on a volcano, Shorty, "'wondering whether it would blow you up or open and let you fall in, "'you're apt to forget your liver. "'It ain't apt to forget you, though,' says I. "'Shall we have a little session right now?' "'And then he springs his proposition. "'He got to go to Washington and back inside the next two breakfasts, "'and he wanted me to go along, some on account of his liver, "'but mostly so he could forget that he was still on the lid.' His private car was hitched to the tail of the flyer, and he had just forty-five minutes to get aboard. Would I come? If I'm wiped out by the time we get back, says he, I'll make you a preferred creditor. I'll take chances on that, says I. They did do the trick to Pyramid once, you know, but they'd never got him right since. They had him worried some this time, though. You could tell that by the way he smiled at the wrong cues and combed his deacon whiskers with his fingers. They're the only deacon whiskers I ever had in the studio. Used to make me nervous when I hit him for fear I'd drive him in. But he's dead game, Pyramid is, whether he's stopping mitts or bucking the upright oil push. So I grabs a few things off the wall and we pikes for the ferry. Where's the other party, says I, when I'd sized up the inside of the Adeline. That was room enough for a minstrel troop. We're to have it all to ourselves, Professor, says he, and it's almost time for us to pull out. There's the last Cortland Street boat in. About then we hears Mr. Rufus Rastus, the Congo brunette that's master of ceremonies on the car, having an argument out in the vestibule. He was trying to shunt somebody, 
They didn't shunt, though, and in comes a long-geared old gent, wearing one of those belted ulsters that they make out of horse blankets for English tourists. He had a dinky cloth cap of the same pattern, and the lengthiest face I ever saw on a man. It wasn't a cheerful face, either. Looked like he was hunting for his own tombstone, and didn't care how soon he found it. Rufus Rastus was hanging to one of his arms, spluttering things about this being a private car, and getting no more notice taken of himself than as if he'd been an escape valve. Behind him, toting a lot of leather bags of all shapes, was a peak-nosed chap, who looked like he was doing all the fretting for a don't-worry club. "'It's only Sir Peter,' said the worried chap. "'He's made a mistake, he know. He'll get him out, sir.' danvers shut up says sir peter yes sir directly sir but says he shut up now and sit down sir peter wasn't scrappy about it he just said it as though he was tired but danvers wilted shall i give him the run says i no says mr gordon there's the bell we can get rid of them at the first stop then he goes over to Sir Peter and tells him all about the Adelines being a private snap and how he can change to a parlor car at Trenton. The old fella seems to take it all in, looking him straight in the eye without turning a hair, and then he says, just as if they'd been talking about it for a month, you'd better wear a bucket as I do. It looks a little odd, you know, but the decimals can't get through a bucket. Danvers, he sings out. But you don't understand, says Pyramid. I said this was a private car. Private car. Don't shout, says Mr. Peter. I'm not deaf. I'd lend you a bucket if I had an extra one, but I haven't. Danvers. This time Danvers edged in with one of those sole leather cases that an Englishman carries his plug hat in. Don't you think, Sir Peter, says he. Yes, but you don't, says Sir Peter. Hurry on now and I'll be welched if Danvers didn't dig a wooden pail out of that hat case and hand it over. Sir Peter chucks the cap, puts on the pail, drops the handle under his chin, and stretches out on a corner sofa as peaceful as a bench duster in the park. Looks like he's got his wheels all under cover, says I. Great scheme. Every man his own garage. Who is he? says Mr. Gordon to Danvers. Lord, sir, you don't mean to sigh, you don't know Sir Peter, sir, says Danvers. Why, e's Sir Peter, the Sir Peter. E's a bit eccentric at times, sir. Well, we let it go at that. Sir Peter seemed to be enjoying himself, so we piles all the wicker chairs around him, opens the ventilators, and peels down for business. Ever try handball in a car that's being snaked over switches at fifty miles an hour? So far as looks went, we were just as bad as Sir Peter with his wooden hat. We caromed around like a couple of six spots in a dice box, and some of the footwake we did would have had a bucking wing artist crazy. We was using a tennis ball, and when we'd get in three strokes without missing, we'd stop and shake hands. There wasn't any more sense to it than a musical comedy, but it was making Mr. Gordon forget his troubles, and it was doing his liver good. Danvers watched us from behind some chairs. He looked disgusted. By the time we got halfway across Jersey, he was ready for a bathtub. And say, that's the way to travel and stay at home all at once. A private car for mine. While we was putting on a polish with the Turkish towels, Rufus Raftus was busy with the dinner. Now we'll have another talk with Sir Peter of the Pale, says Mr. Gordon. We took the barricade down and found him just as we left him. Then he and Pyramid gets together, but it was the wizziest brand of conversation I ever heard. You'd have thought they was talking over the phone to the wrong numbers. Sir Peter would listen to all Mr. Gordon had to say, just as if he was getting next to every word, but his comebacks didn't fit by a mile. Sorry to disturb you, says Mr. Gordon, but I'll have to ask you to change for a forward car next stop. Sir Peter blinked his lamps at him a minute, and then he says, Yes, it keeps the decimals out, and he taps the bucket, knowing-like. My own invention, sir, I'd advise you to try if they ever bother you. Yes, I'll take your word for that, says Mr. Gordon, 
but I'm afraid you'll have to be getting ready to move. This is my private car, you see. They always come point first, says Mr. Peter. That's how they get in. It's only the bucket that makes them shy off. Oh, the deuce, says Pyramid. Here, Shorty, you try your luck with him. Sure, says I. I've talked sense through thicker things than a wooden pail. First, I raps on his coupler with me knuckles, just to ring him up. Then when I gets his eye, I says, kind of coaxing, Pete, it's seventeen after six. That's twenty-three for you. Are you next? Now say, you thought most anyone would have dropped for a hint like that, dippy or not. But Sir Peter sizes me up without batting an eye. He had a kind of dignified, solemn way of looking, too, with eyes wide open, same's a judge charging a jury. You'll never need a bucket, says he. Just then I heard something that sounded like pouring water from a jug, and I looks around to see Mr. Gordon turning plum color and holding himself by the short ribs. I knew what had happened then. The nutty one had handed me the lemon. Scratch me off, says I. I'm in the wrong class. If there's to be any more Bloomingdale repartee, just count me out. Nah, I wouldn't saw nothing like that. If anyone can get free vaudeville from me, I'll write him an annual pass. But I couldn't see the use of monkeying with that bug house border. Say, if you was paying for five rooms and bath when you went on the road, like Mr. Gordon was, would you stand for any machinery loft butt in like that? I was waiting for the word to pile Sir Peter on the baggage truck, Danvers and all. Think I got it? Nix. Some folks is easy pleased. And Pyramid Gordon, with seventeen different kinds of trouble being warmed up for him behind his back, stood there and played kid. Said he couldn't think of losing Sir Peter after that. He got to have dinner with us. Blessed if he didn't, too, pale and all. Couldn't fall for any talk about changing cars. Oh, no. But when he sees the pink candles and the oysters on the half and the quart bot in the ice bath, he seemed to get his hearing back wireless. Dinner, says he. Ah, uh, yes. Danvers, has the Prime Minister come yet? It was tonight that he was to dine with me, wasn't it? Tomorrow night, Sir Peter, says Danvers. Oh, very well, but you gentlemen will share the joint with me, eh? Come to Branscombe Arms, and let's gather around, sirs, let's gather around. You should have seen the way he did it, though. Regular John Drew Manners, the old duffer had. Lord knows where he thought he was, though. Somewhere in Highgate Road, I suppose. But wherever it was, he was right to home, called Rufus Raftus Jenkins, and told Danvers he could go for the day. Gave me the goose flesh back until I got used to it but Mr. Gordon seemed to take it all as part of the game. It beat all the dinners I ever had, that one. There we were, pounding over the rails through Pennsylvania at a mile-a-minute clip, the tomato soup doing a merry-go-round in the plates, the engine tooting for grade crossings, and Sir Peter wearing as pale as dignified as a cardinal does a red hat, talking just as if he was back on the farm up north of London. I don't blame Rufus Raftus for wearing his eyes on the outside. They stuck out like waist buttons on a Broadway cop, and he hardly knew whether he was waiting on table or making up a berth. With his second glass of fizz, Sir Peter began to thaw a little. He hadn't paid much attention to me for a while, passing most of his remarks over to Mr. Gordon. But all of a sudden he comes at me with, You're a home ruler, I expect. Sure, says I. Now spring the gag. But if there was any stinger to it, he must have lost it in the shuffle, for he opens up a line of talk that I didn't have the key to at all. Mr. Gordon tells me afterwards it was English politics and that Sir Peter was trying to register me as a conservative. Anyway, I promised to vote for Balfour, or somebody like that, next election, so I'm going to send word to little Tim that he needn't come round. Had to do it, just to please the old gent. By the time we got to the little cups of black, he'd switch to something else. I don't suppose you know anything about railroads, he says to Mr. Gordon. Then it was my grin. Railroads is what Pyramid plays with, you know. He's a director on three or four lines himself, and he's always looking for more. 
it's about as safe to leave a branch road after nightfall when Gordon's around as it would be to try to raise watermelons in Minetta Lane. He grinned, too, and said something about not knowing as much about him as he did once. With that, Sir Peter lights up one of Mr. Gordon's Key West nightsticks and cuts a drift on the railroad business. That made the boss kind of sick at first. Railroads was something he was trying to forget for the evening. But there wasn't any shutting the old Jay off. And say, he knew the case cards all right. There was too much high finance about it for me to follow close. But anyways, I see that it made Mr. Gordon sit up and take notice. He'd peg a question now and then, and got the old one so stirred up that after a while he'd shed the bucket, lugged out one of his bags, and flashed a lot of papers up in the neat little piles. He said it was a report he was going to make to some board or other, if ever the decimals would quit bothering him long enough. Well, that sort of thing might keep Mr. Gordon awake, but not for mine. Halfway to Baltimore, I turns in, leaving him at it. I had a good snooze, too. Mr. Gordon comes to my bunk in the morning, very mysterious. Shorty, says he, we're in. I've got to go up to the State Department for an hour or so, and while I'm gone, I'd like you to keep an eye on Sir Peter. If he takes a notion to wander off, you persuade him to stay until I get back. What you say goes, says I. I shoved up the shade and sees that they'd put the Adeline down at the end of the train shed. About all I could see of Washington was the top of old George's headstone sticking up over a freight car. I'd fixed myself up and had breakfast, just as if I was in a boarding house, and then sits around waiting for Sir Peter. He and Danvers shows up after a while, and the old gent calls for tea and toast and jam. Then I knows he's farther off his base than ever. Think of truck like that for breakfast. But he gets away with it, and then says to Danvers, Time we were off to the city, my man. I got a glimpse of trouble ahead right there, for that chump of a Danvers never made a move when I gives him the wink. All he could get into that peanut butter head of his at one time was to collect those leather bags and get ready to trot around wherever that long-legged old lunatic led the way. They've changed the time on that train of yours, Sir Pete, says I. She don't come along until 1026 now, spring schedule and I winks an eye loose at Danvers. "'Pon my word,' says Sir Peter. "'You here yet? Danvers, show this poison to the gates.' "'Yes, sir,' says Danvers. He comes up to me and whispers, kind of ugly. "'I sigh now. You'll have to stop chaffing, Sir Peter. I won't have it.' "'Help,' says I. "'There's a rat after me.' I'll bash your bloomin' nose in, says he, getting pink behind the ears. I'll write to the bloomin' pipers about it if you do, says I. I was wishin' that would fetch him, and it did. He comes at me wide open, with a guard like a soft-shell crab. I slips down the stateroom passage out of sight of Sir Peter, catches Danvers by the scruff, chucks him into the boith, and ties him up with the sheets as careful as if he was to go by express. Now make all the holly you want, says I. It won't disturb us none. And I shut the door. But Sir Peter was a different proposition. I didn't want to roughhouse him. He was too ancient, and anyway, I kind of liked the old chap looks. He'd forgot all about Danvers, and was making figures on an envelope when I got back. I let him figure away until all of a sudden he puts up a pencil and lugs out that bucket again. It's quit raining, says I. But do you know about it, says he. It's pouring decimals, just pouring them. But I've got to get my report then. With that, he claps on the bucket, grabs a bag, and starts for the car door. It was up to me to make a quick play, for he was just ripe to go button around those tracks and run afoul of a switch engine. I hated to collar him. Just then, I spots the tennis ball. Whoopee, says I, grabbing it up and slamming it at his head. I made a bullseye on the pail, too. That's a cigar you owe me, says I, and I get two more cracks for my nickel. He tried to dodge, but I slammed it at him a couple more times. You're toying now, says I. Give me the bucket. Sounds foolish, don't it? I'll bet it looked a heap foolisher than it sounds. 
but I'd just thought of something a feller told me once. He was a young doctor in the bat ward at Bellevue. They're a good deal like kids, says he, and if you remember that, you can handle em easy. And say, Sir Peter seemed to look tickled and interested. The first thing I knew, he chucked a bucket on my head and was doing a war dance, lambasting that tennis ball at me to beat the cars. It was working all right. When he got tired of that, I organized a shinny game with an umbrella and a cane for sticks and a couple of wicker chairs for goals. He took to that, too. First he shed his frock coat and then his vest. Then after a while, we got down to our undershirts. It was a hot game from the way go. There wasn't any halfway business about Sir Peter. When he started out to drive a goal through my legs, he whacked good and strong and often. My shins looked like a barber's pole afterwards, but I couldn't squeal then. There was no way to duck punishment but to get the ball into his territory and make him guard goal. It wasn't such a cinch to do either, for he was a lively old gent on his pins. After about a half an hour of that, you can bet I wished I'd stuck to the bucket game. But Sir Peter was excited over it as a boy with a new pair of roller skates. He wouldn't stand for any change of program, and he wouldn't stop for breathing spells. Rufus Rastus came out of his coop once to see what the row was all about. But when he saw us mixed up in a scrimmage for goal, he says, Good Lord Almighty, lets out one yell and shuts himself up with his canned soup and copper pans. I guess Danvers thought I was dragging his boss around by the hair, for I heard him yelp once in a while, but he couldn't get loose. Sir Peter began to leak all over his head, and his gray hair got mussed up and his eyes was bulging out, but I couldn't get him switched to anything else. Not much. Shinny was the new game to him, and he was stuck on it. Wee ye, he'd yell, and swing that crooked-handled cane, and bang would go a fancy gas globe into a million pieces. But a little thing like that didn't fiaze him. He was out for goals, and he wasn't particular what he hit as long as the ball was kept moving. It was a hot pace, he said, all right. Every time he swung, I had to jump two feet high or else get it on the shins. And say, I jumped when I could. I'd given a sable-lined overcoat for a pair of leg guards just about then, and if I could have had that young bug ward doctor to myself for about ten minutes, well, he'd have learned something they didn't tell him at Bellevue. Of course, I don't keep up regular ring training these days, but I'm generally fit for ten rounds or so any old time. I thought I was in good trim then, until that dippy old snoozer had rushed me for about twenty-five goals. Then I began to breathe hard and wish someone would ring the gong on him. There was no counting on when Mr. Gordon would show up, but his footsteps wouldn't have made me sad. I let myself in for some jay stunts in my time, but this getting tangled up with a bad dream that had come true, well, that was the limit. And I'd started out to do something real cute. You could have bought me for a bunch of pink trading stamps. And just as I was wondering if Bloomingdale's seance was to go on all day, Sir Peter gives out like a busted mainspring, slumps all over the floor, and lays as limp as if his jaw had connected with a pile driver. For a minute or so, I was scared clear down to my toenails. But after I sluiced them up with ice water and worked them over a little, he came back to the boards. He was groggy, and I reckon things was looping the loops when he looked at him. But his blood pump was doing business again, and I knew he'd feel better pretty soon. I helped him up on the bucket, that being the handiest, and threw a three-finger slug of rye into him, and then he began to take an inventory of things in general, kind of slow and dignified. He looks at the broken glass on the car carpet, at the chairs toying bottom up, at me in my hard work costume, and at his own rig. Really, you know, really, I, I don't quite understand, he says. Where, what? Oh, you're ahead, says I. I wouldn't swear to the score, but it's your odds. This didn't seem to satisfy him, though. He kept on looking around as though he'd lost something. I guess he was hunting for that blasted cane. See here, says I, you get the decision and there ain't going to be any encore. I've retired. 
I've had enough of that game to last me until I'm as old as you are, which won't be for two or three seasons on. If you're dead anxious for more, you wait until Mr. Gordon comes back and challenge him. He's a sport. But Sir Peter seemed to be clear off the alley. My good man, says he, I, I don't follow you at all. Will you please tell me where I am? Now say, how was I to know where he thought he was? What was the name of that place? Brisket Arms? I didn't want to chance it. This is the same old stand, says I, right where you started an hour ago. But, says he, but Lord Winchester... He's due on the next trolley, says I. Had to stop off at the gun factory, you know. Ever try to tear off a lot of extemporaneous lies, twenty to the minute? It's no pipe. Worse than being on the stand at the insurance third degree. I couldn't even refuse to answer on advice of counsel, and in no time at all he had me twisted up into a bow knot. Young man, says he, I think you're prevaricating. I'm doing me best, says I, but let's cut that out. Perhaps you'd feel better if you wore the bucket a while. Bucket, says he, and I'll be put on the buzzer if he didn't throw the bluff that he'd never had the thing on his head. Oh, well, says I, you've got the right to lie some if you want to. It's your turn anyway, but let me swab you off a little. He didn't kick on that, and I was getting busy with warm water and towels when the door opens, and in drifts Mr. Gordon with three well-fed gents behind him. Great cats, says he, throwing up both hands. Shorty, what in blazes has happened? Nothing much, says I. We've been playing a little shinny. Shinny, says he, just as though it was something I had invented. Sure, says I, and Sir Peter won out. As a shinny player, he's a bird. Then the three other ducks swarms in, and the way they powwows around there for a few minutes was enough to make a coitin scene for a Third Avenue melodrama. Mr. Gordon calmed them down, though, after a bit, and then I got a chance. I was a little riled by that time, I guess. I offered to tie pillars in both hands and take them all three at once, kicking aloud. Oh, come, Shorty, says Mr. Gordon. These gentlemen have been a little hasty. They don't understand and they're great friends of Sir Peter. This is the British ambassador, Lord Winchester, and these are his two secretaries. Now what about this shinny? It was a stemwinder, says I. Sir Peter was offside most of the time, but I don't carry no grouch for that. Then I told him how I'd done it to keep him off the tracks, and how he got so warmed up he couldn't stop until he ran out of steam. They were polite enough after that. We shook hands all around, and I went in and resurrected Danvers, and they got Sir Peter fixed up so that he was fit to go in a cab, and the whole bunch clears out. In about an hour, Mr. Gordon comes back. He wears one of the won't-come-off kind, and steps like he was feeling good all over. Professor, says he, you needn't be surprised at getting the Medal of Honor from the British government. You seem to have cured Sir Peter of the bucket habit. We are quits, then, says I. He's cured me of wanting to play shinny. Say, did you find out who the old snoozer was, anyway? The old snoozer, says he, is the crack financial expert of England, and a big gun, generally. He'd been over here looking into our railroads, and when he gets back, he's to make a report that will be accepted as law and gospel in every capital of Europe. It was while he was working on that job that his brain took a vacation, and it was your shinny game, the doctor says, that saved him from the insane asylum. You seem to have brought him back to his senses. He's welcome, says I, but I wish the British government would ante up a bottle of spaven cure. Look at that shin. We'll make him pay for that shin, says he, with a kind of it's coming to us grin. And by the way, shorty, those few after-dinner remarks that Sir Peter made about his report, you could forget about hearing him, couldn't you? I can forget everything but the bucket, says I. Good, says Mr. Gordon. It, it's a private matter for a while. We took a handsome ride around town until the noon limited was ready to pull out. Never saw a car ride do a man so much good as that one back to New York seemed to do Mr. Gordon. He was as pleased with himself as if he was a red apple on the top branch. It was a couple of weeks, too, before I knew why. 
He let it out one day after we had our little caffy clatch with the gloves. Seems that hearing Sir Peter tell what he was going to report about American railroads was just like giving Gordon an owner's tip on a handicap winner. And Pyramid don't need to be hit on the head with a maul, either. Near as I can get it, he worked that inside information for all it was worth, and there's a bunch down around Broad Street that don't know just what hit him yet. Me? Little Rollo? Oh, I'm satisfied. With what I got out of that trip, I could buy enough shin salve to cure up all the bruises in New York. That's on the foot rule, too. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recordings in the public domain. It was that little excursion with Mr. Gordon that put me up to sendin over to Williamsburg after Swifty Joe Gallagher and signin him as my first assistant. Thinks I, if I'm liable to go strollin off like that any more, I've got to have some one that'll keep the joint open while I'm gone. I didn't pick Swifty for his looks, nor for his mammoth intellect but he's as straight as a string, and he'll mind like a set of dog. Well, say, it was lucky I got him just as I did. I hadn't much more than broke him in before I runs up against this new one. Understand, I ain't no fad chaser. I don't pine for the sportin' extra life with a new red ink stunt for every leaf on the calendar pad. I got me studio here and me real money regulars that keep the shop runnin', and a few of the boys to drop round now and then, so I'm willing to let it go at that. Course, though, I ain't no side-stepper. I takes what's comin' and tries to look pleasant. But this little hot-foot act with Raja and Pinckney had me dizzy for a few rounds, sure as ever. And I wouldn't thought it of Pinckney. Why, when he first shows up here, I says to myself, Next floor, Reginald, for the manicure. He was one of that kind, slim, white-livered, featherweight style of chap. Looks like he'd been training on Welch rabbits and Egyptian cigarettes at the club for about a year. Is this Professor McCabe, says he. You win, says I. What'll it be? Me class in crochet ain't begun yet. He kind of looks me over steady-like, and then he passes out a card which says how he was Lionel Pinckney Ogden Bruce. Do I have my choice, says I? Cause if I do, I nips in the Pinckney. It's cute. Well, Pinckney, what's doing? He drapes himself on a chair, gets his little silver-headed stick balanced just so between his knees, pulls his trousers up to high watermark, and takes an inventory of me from the mat up. And say, when he got through, I felt as though he knew it all from how much I'd weigh in at to where I had my laundry done. Yes, Pickney had a full set of eyes. They were black, not just ordinary black, seems a hole in a hat, but shiny and sparkling, like patent leathers in the sun. If it hadn't been for them eyes, you might have thought he was one of the eight-day kind that was just about to run down. I ought to have got next to Pinkney's model just by his lamps, but I didn't. I'm learning, though, and if I last long enough, I'll be a wise guy some day. Well, when Pinckney finishes the census of me, he says, Professor, I wish to take a private course, or whatever you call it. I would like to engage your exclusive services for about three weeks. Chick-chick, says I. Things like that come high, young man. Pinckney digs up a sweet little checkbook, unlimbers a fountain pen, and asks, how much, please? Seeing as this is the slack season with me, I'll make it fifty per, says I. Hour or day, says he. Maybe I was breathing a bit hard, but I says careless like, oh, call it fifty a day in expenses. Business with a pen. That's for the first week, says Pinckney, and I see he'd reckon in Sunday and all. When can you come on, says I. I'll begin now if you don't mind, says he. Then it was up to me, so I goes to work. Inside of ten minutes I had a fair notion of how Pinckney was put up. He wasn't as skimpy as he looked from the outside, but I saw that it wouldn't be safe to try the mitts. I might forget and put a little steam into the punch, then it would be a case of sweeping up the pieces. 
Hold that out, says I, chucking him the shot bag. He put it out, but all there was in him was bracing that arm. What you need, says I, is a little easy track work in the open, plenty of cold water before breakfast, and a sleep in ten-hour doses. I couldn't sleep five hours at a stretch, much less ten, says he. We'll take something for that, says I. We gets together a couple of suits of running togs, sweaters, towels, and things, and goes downstairs where Pinckney has a big plum-colored homicide wagon waiting for him. Tell Goggles to point for Jerome Avenue, says I. There's a track out there we can use. On the way up, Pinckney lets loose a hint or two that gives me an outline map of his particular case. He hadn't been hitting up any real paresis pace, so far as I can make out. He'd just been trying to keep even with the coupons and dividends that the old man had left him, burning it as it came in, and he'd run out of matches. Guess there was a bunch of millinery somewhere in the background, too, for he was anxious about how he'd feel around horse show time. Maybe Pinckney had made his plans to be more or less agreeable about then, but when he got a kinescope picture of himself in a sanitarium, he had a scare thrown into him. Next, someone gives him a tip on the physical culture studio, and he pikes for Shorty McCabe. Well, I've trained a good many kinds, but I never tried to pump red corpuscles into an amateur Romeo before. There was the 350, though, and I sails in. Head up now, elbows in, weight on your toes, and we're off in the bunch, says I. Steady there, take it easy. This ain't no hundred-yard sprint. This is a mile performance. There, that's better. Dog trot it to three quarters, and if your cork ain't pulled by then, you can spur it under the wire. But Pinckney had lost all his ambition before we got half round. At the finish, he was breathing more air than his wind tanks had known in months. Now for the second lap, says I. What? Around that fence again, says Pinckney. Why, I saw all there was to see last time. Can't we try a new one? Do you think mile tracks come in clusters, says I? Why not just run up the road, asks Pinckney. The road it is, says I. We fixed it up that Goggles was to follow along in the goose cart and honk honk the quarters to us as he read them on his speed clock. We were three miles nearer Albany when we quit, and Pinckney was leaking like a squeezed sponge. Throw her wide open and pull up at the nearest roadhouse, says I to Goggles. He found one before I had got all the wraps on Pinckney, and in no time at all we were under the shower. There was less of that marble slab look about Pinckney when he began to harness up again. He thought he could eat a little something, too. I stood over the block while the man cut that three-inch hunk from the top of the round, and then I made a mortal enemy of the cook by juggling the broiler myself. But Pinckney did more than nibble. After that, he wanted to turn in sleep. I had to lift him out at 4 g.m. The water cure woke him, though. He tried to beg off the last few glasses, but I made him down them. Then we starts toward Boston, goggles behind, and Pinkney discovers the first sunrise he's seen for years. Well, that's the way we went perambulating up into the pie belt. First we'd jog a few miles, and then hop aboard the whiz wagon and spurt for running water. We didn't travel on any schedule or try to make any dates. Half the time, we didn't know where we were and didn't care. When bathtubs got scarce, we hunted for a pond or a creek in the woods. In one of the side hampers on the car, I found a quick lunch outfit, so I gets me a broiler, lays on a round of steak and rye bread, and twice a day I does the hobo act over a roadside fire. That tickled Pickney to death. Nights... We'd strike any place where they had beds to let. Pinckney didn't punch the mattress or toin up his nose at the quilt patterns. When it came dark, he was glad enough to crawl anywhere. Now this was all to the good. Never quite saw so much picnic weather rattle out of the box all at one throw. And the work didn't break your back. Why, it was like being laid off for a vacation on double pay. Until Raja butted in and began to mix things. We'd pulled into some little town or other up in Connecticut soon after sun-up, looking for soft-boiled eggs. 
when a couple of real gents in last year ulsters pipes us off and saunters up to the car they spots pickney for the cash carrier and makes the play at him it was a hard luck symposium of course but there were more to it than just a panhandle touch they were all that was left of the imperial consolidated circus and roman menagerie they had lost their top and benches in a fire deputy sheriffs had nabbed the wagons and horses the company was hoofing back the broadway and all they had left was raja would the honorable gentleman come and take a squint at raja for why well it was this way they hated to do it raja being an old friend just like one of the family you might say but there wasn't anything else they just got to hawk raja to put the imperial consolidated in commission again the waste part of it was these here villagers didn't appreciate what gilt-edged security roger was but his honor would see that the two fifty was nothing at all to lend out for a beggarly week or so on such a magnificent specimen why raja was as good as real estate or government bonds as for selling him ten thousand wouldn't be a temptation would the gentleman just step around to the stable it was then i began to put up the odds on pinckney i got a wink from them black eyes of his and there was the very divil and all in him with his face as straight as a crowbar certainly says he we'll be happy to meet raja they had him moored to one of the floor beams with an ox chain around his nigh hind foot he wasn't as big as all outdoors nor wasn't he a vest pocket edition either as elephants go he wouldn't have made the welterweight class by about a ton he was what i'd call just a handy size about two bureaus high by one wide his ivory stoop rails had been sawed off close to his jaw so he didn't look any more wicked than a folding bed and his eyes didn't have that shifty wait till i get loose look they generally does they were kind of soft widowy oh me poor child eyes he is sad very sad about all this says one of the real gents no rajah knows almost as much as we do sir pinckney took his word for it i think i shall accommodate you with that loan says he come into the hotel say i didn't think you could go brick pinckney as easy as that one of the guys wrote out a receipt and pinckney shoved it into his pocket handing over a wad of yellowbacks they didn't lose any time about heading southeast those two in the ulsterettes then we goes back to have another look at raja it's a wonderful thing professor this pride of possession says pinckney only a few poisons in the world own elephants i am one of them even though it is only for a week and he is miles away i shall feel that i own raja and it will make me glad then he winks so i knows he's just being gay but raja didn't seem so gladsome he was rocking his head back and forth and just as we gets there out rose a big tear about a tumblerful can't we do something to choke him up a bit says i he seems to take it hard being hung up on a ticket there's something the matter with this elephant says pinckney taking a front view of him he's in pain see if you can't find a veterinary professor yes they said there was a horse doctor knocking around the country somewhere he worked in the shingle mill by spells and then again the chair factory or odd jobs a blond-haired native turned up who was sure the doc had gone hog killing up to the corners so i goes back to the stable i found out says pinckney it's toothache he showed me open up raja and let the professor see up up Raja was accommodating. He unhinged the top half of his face so to give me a private view. We used a box of matches locating that punky grinder. There was a hole in it big enough to drop a pool ball into. Talk about your chamber of horrors. Think what it must be to be as big as that and feel bad all over. I never worked in an open all night painless shop, says I, but I think I could do something for that if I could tap a drug store good says pinckney we passed one down the road they kept grindstones and stove polish and dress patterns there too but they had a row of bottles in one corner 
Give me a roll of cotton batten and a quart of oil of cloves, says I to the man. He grinned and ripped a little ten-cent bottle of toothache drops off a card. It may feel that way, but you'll find this plenty, says he. You get busy with my order, says I. This ain't my ache. It's Raja's, and Raja's an elephant. Show, says he, and hands over all he had in stock. I went back on the jump. We made a wad half as big as your head, soaked in the clove oil and rammed it down with a nail hammer. It was the fromage, all right. And say, ever see an elephant grin and look tickled and try to say thank you? The way he talked deaf and dumb with his trunk and shook hands with us and patted us on the back was almost as human as the way a man acts when the jury brings in not guilty. Inside of three minutes, Raja was that kinky, he tried to do a double shuffle and nearly wrecked the barn. It made us feel good, too, and we stood around there and threw bouquets at ourselves for what we'd done. Then the cook came out, wanting to know should she keep right on boiling them eggs or take them off, so we remembers about breakfast. Calling for a new deal on the eggs, we sent out word for him to fix up a tub of hot mash for Raja and told the landlord to give our friend the best in the stable. Raja was fetching the bottom of the tub when we went out to say goodbye. He stretched his trunk out to us as we went through the door. We'd climbed into the car and was just getting under way when we hears things smash and looks back to see Raja with a section of his stable floor dragging behind, coming after us on the gallop. Beat it, says I to Goggles, and he was reaching for the speed lever when he sees a town constable with a tin badge like a stove lid pull a brass watch on us. What's the limit, shouts Pinkney. Ten an hour or ten dollars, says he. Here's your ten and costs, says Pinkney, tossing him a sawbuck. Go ahead, Francois. We jumped into that village ordinance at a forty-mile-an-hour clip and would have had Raja hold down in about two minutes, but Pinckney had to take one last look. The poor old mutt had quit after a few jumps. He had squat in the middle of the road, lifted up his trombone frontspiece, and was bellowing out his grief like a calf that had lost its mommer. Pinckney couldn't stand for that for a minute. "'I say now, we'll have to go back,' says he. "'That whale would haunt me for days if I didn't.' So back we goes to Raja, and he almost stands on his head, He's so glad to see us again. We'll just have to slip away without his knowing it next time, says Pinckney. Perhaps he will get over his gratitude in an hour or so. We unhitches Raja from the stable floor and starts back for the hotel. The landlord met us halfway. Don't you bring that critter near my place again, shouts he. Take him away before he tears the house down. And no jollying nor green money would change that hayseed's mind. The whole population was with him, too. While we were jawing about it, long comes the town marshal with some kind of injunction warning us to remove Raja, the same being a menace to life and property. There was nothing for it but the sneak. We moves out that boy at half speed, with old Raja padding close behind, his trunk resting affectionately on the tonneau back, and a kind of satisfied right-to-home look in them little eyes of his made me feel like a pair of yellow shoes at a dance. But Pinckney seemed to think there was something funny about it. And over the hills and far away the happy princess followed him, as Tennyson puts it, says he. Tennyson was dead onto his job, says I. But when do we annex the steam calliope and the boys in red coats with banners? We ought to have the rest of the grand forenoon parade, or else shake Raja. Oh, perhaps we can find quarters for him in the next town, where he hasn't disgraced himself, says Pinckney. Pinckney hadn't counted on the telephone, though. A posse with shotguns and bench warrants met us a mile out from the next place and shooed us away. They'd heard that Raja was a man-killer, and they had brought along a pound of arsenic to feed him. After they'd been coaxed from behind their barricade, though, and had seen what a gentle, confiding beast Raja really was, they compromised by letting us take the road that led into the next county. This is getting sultry, says I, as we goes on the side track. I'm enjoying it, says Pinckney. Now let's have some road wake. Say, you ought to have seen that procession. First comes me and Pinckney in running gear, 
them Raja hoofing along our heels as joyous as a chowder party, and after him goggles with the benzine wagon. Seemed to me I've hoity yarns about how grateful dumb beasts could be to folks that had done em a good turn, but Raja's act made them tales seem like sarsaparilla ads. He was chalk full of gratitude. He was nutty over it. Seemed like he couldn't think of anything else but that wholesale toothache of his and how he got shut of it. He just adopted us on the spot. Whenever we stopped, he'd hang around and look over, kind of admiring, and we couldn't move a step, but he was there, flapping his big ears and swinging his trunk, just as though he was saying, Whoopee, me fellas, you're the real persimmons, you are. Well, we couldn't find the hotel where they'd take us in at night, so we had to bribe a farmer to let us use his spare bedrooms. We tethered Raja to a big apple tree just under our windows to keep him quiet and let him browse on a rosa sharon bush. He only ripped off the rain pipe and trod a flower bed as hot as a paved court. At breakfast, Pinckney remarks, sort of soothing, We might as well enjoy Raja's society while we have it. I suppose the circus men will be after him in a few days. Then he remembers that receipt and pulls it out. I could see something was queer by the way he screwed up his mouth. He tossed the paper over to me. Say, do you know what them two Ulsteric guys had done? They'd given Pinckney a bill of sale, making over all rights, privileges, and goodwill entire. You're it, says I. So it seems, says Pinckney but I hardly know whether I've got Raja or Raja's got me. If I owned something I didn't want, says I, seems to me I'd sell it. There must be other come-ons. We will sell em, says Pinckney. Well, we tried. For three or four days we didn't do anything else, and say, when I think of them days they seem like a mince pie dream. We did our handsomest to make those nutmeggers believe that they needed Raja in their business, that he would be handy to have around the place. But they couldn't see it. We argued with about fifty horny-handed plow pushers, showing them how Raja could pull more than a string of oxen a block long, and could be let out for stump digging in summer, or as a snow plow in winter. We tried liverymen, storekeepers, summer cottages, but the nearest we came to making a sale was to a brewer who had just built a new house with red and yellow fancy woodwork all over the front of it. He thought Raja might make for a lawn ornament and make himself useful as a fountain during dry spells. But when he noticed that Raja didn't have any tusks, he said it was all off. He knew where he could buy a whole cast-iron menagerie with all the frills thrown in at half the price. And we wasn't holding Raja at any swell figure. He was on the bargain counter when the sale began. Every day was a 50% clearance with us. We were closing out our line of elephants on account of retiring from business, and Raja was a remnant. But they wouldn't buy. Generally, they threatened to set the dogs on us. It was worse than trying to sell a cargo of fur overcoats in Panama. In time, it began to leak through into our heads that Raja was not negotiable. Didn't seem to trouble him any. He was just as glad to be with us at first, followed us around like a pet poodle, and got away with his bale of hay as regular as a Rialto ham fatter raiding the free lunch. Is it a life sentence, Pinckney? says I. Is this twin foster brother act to a mislaid elephant to be a continuous performance? If it is, we'd better hit the circuit regular and draw our dough on salary day. For me, I'm sick of having folks act like we was a quarantine station. Let's anchor Raja to something solid and skidoo. But Pinckney couldn't stand to think of Raja being left to suffer. He was getting kind of sore on the business, just the same. Then he plucks a thought. We wise to a friend of his in Newport to run down to the big circus headquarters and jolly them into sending an elephant trainer up to us. A trainer will know how to coax Raja off, says he, and perhaps he will take him as a gift. It's easy money, says I. But it wasn't. That duck in Newport sends back a message that covers four sheets of yellow paper, telling how glad he was to get track of Pinckney again, and how he must come down right away. Oh, they wanted Pinckney bad. It was like the tap of the bell for a twenty-round go with a referee missing. Seems that Mrs. Jerry Toynbee was trying to pull off one of those backyard affairs that win newspaper space. 
some kind of a fool amateur circus, and they got to have Pinckney there to manage it, or the thing would flush. As for the elephant trainer, he'd forgot that. By Jove, says Pinckney, real sassy-like. That's drawn it mild, says I. Would you like the loan of a few able-bodied cusswades? But I have an idea, says Pinckney. Handcuff it, says I. It's a case of breaking and entering. But he didn't have so much loft room to let, after all. His first move was to hunt up a railroad station and charter a box car. We coppers it with hay, has a man knock together a couple of high bunks in one end, and throws in some new horse blankets. Now, says Pinckney, you and I and Raja will start for Newport on the night freight. Have you asked Raja, says I? But Raja knew all about riding in box cars. He walked up the plank after us just like we was a pair of Noahs. Goggles was sent off over the road with the cart by all his lonesome. I've traveled a good deal with real sports, and once I came back from St. Louis with the delegates to the National Convention, but this was my first trip in an animal car. It wasn't so bad, though, and it was all over by daylight next morning. There wasn't anyone in sight but milkmen and baker's boys as we drove down Bellevue Avenue, with Raja gripping the rear axle of our cab. I don't know how he felt about buttoning the Newport Society at that time of day, but I looked for a cop to pinch us as second story men. We fetches up to the swellest kind of ranch you ever saw, iron gates to it like a storage warehouse, and behind that trees and bushes and lawn like a slice out of Central Park. Pinckney wakes up the lodge keeper, and after he lets down the bars, we pikes around to the stable. It looked more like an Episcopal church than a stable, and we didn't find any horses inside anyway, only seven different kinds of gasoline carts. The stable hands all seemed to know Pinckney and to be proud of it, but they shied some at Raja and me. This is part of a little affair I'm managing for Mrs. Toynbee, says Pinckney. Professor McCabe and Raja will stay here for a day or two, strictly incognito, you know. What Pinckney says seems to be rules and regulations there, so Raja and I got the glad hand after that. And for a stable visit, it was the best that ever happened. I've stopped at lots of two-dollar houses that would have looked like bowery lodgings alongside of that stable. And one of the boys thought he could handle the mitts some. Yes, that incog business wasn't so worse after fifty per. All this time, Pinckney was as busy as the man at the ticket window, only dropping in once or twice after dark to see if Raja was staying good. The show was being knocked into shape, and Pinckney was master of ceremonies. I knew he was going to wake Raja in somehow, but he didn't have any time to put me next, and I never tumbled until he sprung the trick. About the third day, things began to hum around the Toynbee place. A gang of tent men came with a round top and put it up. They strung a lot of sideshow banners, too, and built lemonade stands in the shrubbery. If it hadn't been for the Johnny boys in hot clothes strolling around, you'd thought a real one-ring wagon show had struck town. But say, that bunch of clowns and bum bareback riders had papas who could have given them a four-paw outfit every birthday. Early the next morning, I got the tip from Pinckney to sneak Raja out of the stable and over into the dressing tent. The way that old chap's eyes glistened when he saw the banners and things was a wonder. He sure did know a heap, that Raja. He was excited and anxious as a new chorus girl at a fall opening, but when I gave him the word, he held himself in. Just before the grand entry, I got a peek at the house, and it was a swell mob. Same folks that you'll see at the horse show, only there wasn't no dollar head push to rubber at them, as they won on an exhibition. They was just out for fun, and I guess they know how to have it, seeing as that's their steady job. Number four on the program was put down as Mr. Lionel Pinckney Ogden Bruce, with his wonderfully lifelike elephant Raja. I heard the Baca give his song and dance about the act, and he got a great hand. Then Pinckney goes on and the crowd howls. You see, he'd had a loose canvas suit like pajamas made for Raja and stuffed it out with straw. It was painted to look something like elephant hide, but some of the straw had been left sticking through the seams. With Raja sewed inside of this, 
he looked like a rank imitation of himself. Fake, fake, they yells at him as they showed up. Who's playing the hind legs, Lionel? And a lot of things like that. They threw peanuts and apples at Raja and generally enjoyed themselves. Then all of a sudden, Pinckney pulls the puckering string, yanks off the padding, and out walks old Raja as chipper as Billy Jerome. Fetch him? Well, say, you've seen a gang of school kids when the sleight of hand man makes a pass over the eggs in the hat and pulls out a live rabbit? These folks acted the same way. They howled, they hee-hawed, they jumped up and down on the seats. They'd been looking for the same old elephant with two men inside, the good old chestnut that they'd been trying to laugh over for years. And when this Filipino was sprung on them, they were as tickled as a baby with a jack-in-the-box. It wouldn't have got more than a laugh out of a crowd of everyday folks, but that swell mob just went wild over it. It was a new stunt, done special for them by one of their own crowd. Was Pickney it? Why, he was the whole show— they kept him and Raja in the ring for half an hour, and they let loose every time Raja lifted his trunk or napped his ears. When he got him quiet, Pinckney made a speech. He said he was happy to say that the Grand Door Prize, as announced on the handbills, had been drawn by Mrs. Jeremiah Toynbee, and that Raja was the prize. Would she take it with her or have it sent? You've heard of Mrs. Jerry. She's a real sport, she is. She's the one that stirred up all that fuss by taking a tame panther down to Bailey's Beach with her. And Mrs. Jerry wasn't going back on her reputation or missing any two-page ads in the papers. You may send him, please, says Mrs. Jerry. Maybe they thought that was all a part of Pickney's fake. They didn't know how hard we tried to unload Raja. We didn't do any lingering around. While the show was going on, we sneaks out of the back of the tent with Raja and crossed to the stable. The rest was easy. He'd got so used to seeing me there that I reckon he'd sized it up for my regular hangout. So when we ties him up fast and slides out easy one at a time, he never mistrusts. Professor, says Pinckney, it seems to me that this is an excellent opportunity for us to go away. It is all of that, says I and let's make it a quick shift. We did. Goggles shook us up some on the way down, but we hit Broadway in time for breakfast. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recordings in the public domain. You didn't happen to see Pinckney at the last horse show, did you? Well, you never know him from the same ambulance fare that dropped into the studio that day. He's been on the rock for two months now, and his nerves are as steady as a truck horse. There's more meat on him, too, than there was. I don't have to have a dustpan ready in case I should jolt him one. But say, next time any two-by-four chappy floats in here for a private course, I gets plans and specifications before I takes him on. No more Raja business in mine, see? There's another thing, too. I'm thinking of hiring a husky boy with a club to do the turnkey act for me. Well, maybe I can get out an injunction against myself to keep me from leaving home. What I need is a life sentence to stay in little old New York. It's the only place where things happen regular and sensible. If you see rocks flying around in the air, or a new building doing the hoochie-coochie and shedding its cornices, or manhole covers popping off, you know just what's up. Nothing but a little stick dynamite handled careless, or some mislaid gas touched off by a plumber. But the minute I let someone lead me across a ferry or beyond the Bronx, the event card is on the blink, and I'm a bunky doodle boy. Long's I don't get more than a mile from 42nd Street, I'm Professor McCabe, and the cops pass me the time of day. Outside of that, I'm a stray, and anyone that gets the fit ties a can to me. It was my mix-up with that Blenmont aggregation that stirs me up. Pickney was at the bottom of this, too. Of course, I can't register any kick, for when it comes to doing the hair-trigger friendship act, Pickney's the real shookum preferred but this was once when he slipped me a blank. Looked like being fed with a spoon, too, at the start. 
All I had to do was to take the 136 out to Blenmont, put in an hour with Jarvis, catch the 350 back, and charge anything I had the front to name. What's more, I kind of cottoned to Jarvis from the drop of the hat. He was waiting at the station for me with a high-wheeled cart and a couple of gingery circus horses hitched one in front of the other like two links of wiener waist. They were trying to play leapfrog as the train comes in, but it didn't seem to worry Jarvis any more than if he was driving a pair of mail wagon plugs. One of those big pink and white chaps, Jarvis was, with nice blue eyes and ashes of roses hair. There was a lot of em, and it was well placed. He had sort of a soothing, easy way of talking, too, like a church organ with a soft pedal on. Me and Jarvis got acquainted right away. He said he didn't care much about the physical culture game, didn't exactly need it, and he'd been through all that before, anyway. But mother and sister wanted him to take it up again, and Pickney had told him what a crackerjack I was. So he thought he might as well go in for it. He said he'd had a little hole fixed up where one could do that sort of thing, you know, and he hoped I wouldn't find it such a beastly bore after all. Oh, he was a gent, Mr. Jarvis, but what got me was the careless way he juggled the reins over those two bobtailed nags that was doing the ragtime runaway, and him using only three fingers and touching em up with the whip. It was his lucky day, though, and we got there without an ambulance. It was something of a place to get to, yes, about a hundred and steen rooms and bath, I should say, with the back yard that must have sloped over into Connecticut some. That's what you get for having a grandpa who put his thumbprint on every dollar that came his way. I guess Jarvis was used to living in a place like that, though. He didn't stop to tell what anything cost or show off any of the bric-a-brac. He just led the way through seven or eight parlors and palm rooms until we fetched up in the hole he'd fixed up to exercise in. It was about three times as big as the studio here, and if there was anything missing from the outfit, I couldn't have told what it was. Flying rings, bars, rowing machine, punching bags, dumbbells. Say, with a secretary and a few wall mottos, there was the makings of a YMCA branch right on the ground. Then there was dressing rooms, a shower bath, and a tiled plunge tank like they have in these Turkish places. Lucky you don't go in strong for exercise, says I. If you did, I suppose you'd fix up Madison Square Garden. That architect was an ass, says Jarvis. But mother told him to go ahead. Fancy he thought I was a sandow, you know. Well, we gets into our gym clothes, picks out a set of kid pillars, and had just stepped out onto the rubber for a little warm-up when in sails a fluff delegation. There was a fat old one that looked as though she might be mother, a slim baby-eyed one that any piker would have played for sister, and another that I couldn't place at all. She wasn't a Fifth Avenue girl. You could tell that by the way she wore her hair bunched down on the nape of her neck. But it was a cinch she wasn't any poor relation. Lost their way going to the matinee, eh? says I. Jarvis, he gets pink clear down to his collarbone. I beg pardon, Professor, says he. It's only mother and the girls. I'll send them off. That's right, shoe em, says I. But mother wouldn't shoe any more than a trolley car. Now don't be silly about it, Jarvis, dear, she says. You know how Lady Evelyn dotes on athletics, and how your sister and I do, too. So we're just going to stay and watch you. Oh, come, mother, says Jarvis. It isn't just a thing, you know. Ask Lady Evelyn, says mother. Why, she's one of the patronesses of the Old Witch Cricket Club and pours tea for the young men at their games. Now go ahead, Jarvis. There's a dear. He looks at me for a tip, and that gives him a hunch. But the professor, says he. Oh, Professor McCabe doesn't mind us a bit, do you now, Professor? Says sister, buttoning in, real coy and giddy. I can stand it if you can, says I, and she tips me a goo-goo smile that was all to the candied violets. There, says Mother, now go right on as though we were not here at all, but remember not to be too rough, Jarvis, dear. I grins at that, and Jarvis, dear, looks foolisher than ever, but the ladies had settled themselves in front seats, and there didn't seem to be anything to do but play marbles or quit and go home, and say, I don't know which looked more like a stagehand caught in front of a drop, 
Jarvis and me. We went through some kind of motions, though, until I begin to get over being rattled. Then I tries to brace him up. Little faster with that right counter there, says I, and block more with your elbow. Ah, you're wide open, see? And I taps him once or twice. Now look out for this left lead to the face. Come, use that right a little. Tain't in the sling, is it? Footwork now. You sidestep like a truck horse. There, that's the article. Now let him come. Block counter guard you see i was doing my best to wake up a little excitement and get jarvis to forget the audience but it wasn't much use about all we did was to walk around and pat each other like a pair of kittens there had been as much exercising in passing the plate at church mother thought it was lovely though and sister had that gushy look in her eyes that her kind wears after they've been to see maud adams Lady Evelyn, though, didn't seem to be struck silly by our performance. She acted as though someone had been trying to sell her a gold brick. Her nose was up in the air, and she'd turned a shoulder to us, like she was wondering how long it'd be before the next act was put on. Couldn't blame her, either. That was the weakest imitation of a sparring bout I ever stood up in. But there was no stir in Jarvis. He'd got stage fright, or cold feet, or something of the kind. It wasn't that he didn't know how, for he had the tags of a good amateur about his moves, but somehow he'd been queered. So as soon as we can, we quits. Then sister gets her chance to gush. She rushes to the front and turns the baby stare on me like I was all the goods. Oh, it was just too sweet for anything, says she. Do you know, Professor, I've always wanted to see a real boxing match, but Jarvis would never let me before. He told me horrid stories about how brutal they were. Now I know they're nothing of the sort. I shall come every time you and Jarvis have one, and so will Lady Evelyn. You didn't think it was brutal, did you, Evelyn? Lady Evelyn humped her eyebrows and gave me one look. No, says she. I shouldn't call it brutal exactly. And then she swallows a polite society snicker in a way that made me mad from the ground up. Jarvis didn't lose any of that either. I got a glimpse of him turning automobile red and trying to choke himself with his tongue. It's something like the wand drill we used to do at college, says sister. Don't you like the wand drill, professor? When it ain't done too rough, I'm dead stuck on it, says I. I just knew you didn't like rough games, says she. You don't look as though you would, you know. That's right, says I. Java says that once you knocked out three men in one evening, but I'm sure you weren't rude about it, she goggles. And that's no pipe either, says I. I wouldn't be rude for money. What is a knockout anyway, says she. Why, says I, it's just pushing a feller around the platform until he's too dizzy to stand up. What fun, says sister. We makes a break for the dressing room about then, and the delegation clears out. On the way back to the station, Jarvis apologizes seven different ways and ends up by giving me the cue to the whole game. Seems that mother's steady job in life was to get him married off to someone that suited her for a daughter-in-law. She'd been at it for five or six years, but Jarvis had always blocked the moves until Lady Evelyn shows up. I guess that he'd picked her out himself and was getting along fine when mother begins to mix in and arrange things. Evelyn shies at that and commences to hand Jarvis the frappéd smile. This little visit to the sparring exhibition the old lady had planned for Evelyn's special benefit. But hang it all, says Jarvis. I couldn't stand up there and show off like a Sunday schoolboy spouting a piece. Made me feel like a silly ass, you know. You look the part, says I. About one more of those stunts and Lady Evelyn will want to adopt the two of us. No more, says he. She must think I'm a milksop. Why, she's got brothers that are officers in the British Army, fellows who get themselves shot and win medals and all that sort of thing. Well, I was sorry for Jarvis, for the girl was a good looker, all right, and they'd have made it up fine. But I'm no shotchin. Physical culture's my game, and I ain't taking on no marriage bureau as a sideline. So we shook hands and called it a cancelled contract. And Jarvis jokes those circus horses out of the bow knot and rounds the corner on one wheel, 
while I climbs aboard the choo-choo cars and gets back near Broadway. I wasn't looking to run across Jarvis again, seeing as how me and him has our own particular sets. But twasn't more than three days before he shows up at the studio. He was looking down and out, too. Dropped in for a real rough game of Pussy Wants a Corner, says I. Or shall we make it a ring around the rosy? I say now, Shorty, says he, if you'd had it rubbed in as hard as I have, you'd let up. Hoid from Lady Evelyn, says I. He kind of groaned and fell into a chair. I tried to tell her about it, says he, but she wouldn't listen to a word. She only asked if you were a professor of dancing. Holy chee, says I. Say, you tell her from me that I'm a cloak model, and I'm proud of it. Dancing, Master, eh? You stand for a josh like that? Hang me if I do, says he, jumping up and measuring off three-foot steps across the floor. The Lady Evelyn's going back to England in a few days, but before she leaves, I wanted to have a chance to, well, to see that I'm not the sort she thinks I am, and I want you to help me out, Professor. Ah, say, you got the wrong transfer, says I. I'm nothing but a dub at anything like that. What you want is to get Clyde Fitch to build you a nice little one-act scene where you can play leading gent to her leading lady. You're mistaken, Shorty, says he. I'm not putting up a game. No heroics for me. I'm just a plain ordinary chump and willing to let it go at that. But I'm no softy, and she's got to know it. There's another thing. Mother and sister have carried this athletic nonsense about far enough. They'd like to exhibit me to all the fool women they know as a kind of modern Hercules. And I'm sick of it. Now I've got a plan that ought to cure em of that. For Jarvis, it wasn't so slow. Say, he ain't half so much asleep as he looks. His proposition is to spring the real thing on him, a five-round for keeps, with ring-weight gloves and all the trimmings. They've been bothering me for more, says he. I haven't heard anything else since you were there, and Lady Evelyn's been putting them up to it, I'll bet a hat. What do you say, Professor? Wouldn't you give it to them? I sure would, says I. It's coming to them and I know of two likely red hook boys that's just aching to get at each other in the ring for a fifty-dollar purse. No, no, says Jarvis. I mean to be in this myself. It's, it's necessary, you know. Oh, says I, looking him over kind of curious. But see here, do you think you'd be good for five rounds? I'm not quite in condition now, says he, but there was a time, you know, You've seen these college-trained boxers that think they're hitting real hard when their punch wouldn't dent a cheese pie. We'd have to fake it some, says I. Oh, no, that wouldn't do at all, says Jarvis. This must be a genuine match. I'll put up ten to one, five hundred to fifty, and if I stay the five rounds, I get the fifty. Whee you, says I. It'd be like taking candy from a kid. I couldn't do it. Jarvis, he kind of colored up at that, but he didn't go off his nut. I beg pardon, says he, but I have an idea, you know, that it wouldn't be so one-sided as you think. Well, say, I made lots of easy money off an ideas just like that, and when it was put up to me as a personal favor to do it, I couldn't renig. It did go against the grain to play myself for a long shot, though, but Jarvis wouldn't listen to anything else, claiming his weight and reach made it an even thing. So I takes him on, and we bills the go for the next afternoon. I may have to bring up Swifty Joe for a bottle holder, says I, and Swifty ain't just what you'd call parlor broke. All the better for that, says Jarvis, and I'd be much obliged if you could find another like him for my corner. Of course there's only one Swifty. He's got a bent-in nose and lop ear and a jaw like a hippo. He's won more bouts by scaring his man stiff than any plug in the business. He'd been a champ long ago if it wasn't for a chunk of yellow in him as big as a grapefruit. No, I couldn't match up Swifty. I'd done the next best thing, though. I sent for Gorilla Quigley and gets Mike Slattery to hold the watch on us. Mike gets the hint that this was a swell joint we was going to, so he shows up in South Brooklyn evening dress, plug hat, striped shirt, and sack coat. I make him chuck the linen for a sweater, but I couldn't separate him from the shiny top piece. The gorilla always wears a swimming jersey with a celluloid dicky, 
so he passes muster. Anyways, when old Knee Pants, the Belmont butler, sees us lined up at the front entrance, we had him pop-eyed. He was going to ring up the police reserves when Mr. Jarvis comes out and passes us in. They're a group of 49 per cent, says I, but you said you wanted that kind. It's all right, says he. I've explained to the ladies that a few of my friends interested in physical culture were coming up today, and that perhaps they'd better stay out, but they'll be there just the same. He got them right, too. Just as we'd fixed the ropes and got out the pails and towels, in they floats, mother beaming away like a headlight, sister all fixed ready to blow bubbles, and the lady Evelyn with her nose sticking up in the air. Professor, will you do the honors, says Jarvis to me. And I did em. Ladies, says I, let me put you next to some sure-fired talent. This gent with the ingrown Roman nose piece is me assistant, Swifty Joe Gallagher. He's just as handsome as he looks. Aw, oh, cut it out, said Swifty. Back under the sink with the rest of the pipes, says I, out of the side of my mouth. Then I does another duck. And this here gooseberry blonde and the Alice Blue Joisy is Mr. Gorilla Quigley that put Gans out once. Oh, but. The other gent you may have met before, seeing as he's from one of the first families of Brooklyn, lives under the bridge. His name's Mike Slattery. Now, if you'll excuse us, we'll get busy. As I takes my corner, I could see Mother beginning to look worried, but Sister opens a box of chocolate creams and prepares to have the time of her life. Lady Evelyn springs her log net and sizes up like we was a bunch of Buffalo Bill Indians just off the reservation. I'd forgot to tip off Slattery that there wasn't any postperandials expected of him, so the first thing I knew he was making his little ring speech, just the same as if he was announcing events at the Never Die Athletic Club. Now, gents and ladies, says he, this is a five-round go for a stay between Professor Shorty McCabe, ex-lightweight champion of the world, and another gent what goes on the cards as an unknown. It's catchweights, and the winner pulls down the whole basket of greens. There ain't going to be no hitting after the clinch, and if there's any fouls, you leave it to me. Don't come button in. It's been put up to me to keep time and referee this mix-up, and I don't want no help. You bottle holders stay in your corners till the count's over. Now are you ready? Then go. There was a squeal or two when we shed our bathrobes and steps to the middle, and I guess is that the ladies was getting their first view of ring clothes. But I wasn't looking anywhere but at Jarvis, and say, he would have made a hit anywhere. He had just padding enough to round them out well, and not so much as to make him look ladyfied course he was a good many pounds overweight for the job he'd tackled but he'd have looked mighty well on a poster honest it seemed a shame to have to muss him jarvis wasn't there to stand in the limelight though he went right to work as though he meant business i'd kind of figured on letting him have his own way for a couple of rounds taking it easy and jockeying him into making a showin but the first thing i knows he lands a right swing that near lifts me off my feet and Swifty sings out to me to stop my kidding. Beg pardon, says Jarvis, but I'm after that fifty. If I'd a had a putty jaw, you'd a got it then, says I. Here's the twin to that. But my swipe didn't reach him by an inch, and the best I could do was to swap half-arm jolts until I got steady down again. Well, say, I wasn't more than an hour finding out that I couldn't monkey much with Jarvis. He knew how to let his weight follow the glove, and he blocked as pretty as if he was punching the bag. You didn't learn that in no college, says I, fiddling for a place to plant my left. You're quite right, says he, and he bores in like a snowplow. We steamed up a little in the second, but it was an even break at that, barring the fact that I played more for the wind and had Jarvis breathing fast when Slattery called quits. Gorilla Quigley was on to this job, though, and he gives him good advice while he was waving the towel. I can hear him coaching Jarvis to save his breath and make me do the rushing. Don't waste no time on that cast iron mug of his, says Gorilla. All you gotta do is cover up and stay the limit. But that wasn't Jarvis's program. He begins like a bridge car rusher making for a seat, and he had me back into my corner in no time at all. We mixed it then, mixed it good and plenty. Jarvis wasn't handing out any love taps either. 
and I didn't have beef enough to stop a 180-pound swing without feeling the jaw. I was dizzy from him, all right, but I jumps in close and pounds away on his ribs until he gives ground. Then I comes to Nelson Crouch and rips a few crossovers in where they'd do the most good. That didn't stop him, though. Pretty soon he comes in for more. Say, I never see a guy that could look pleasanter while he was passing out hot ones. It wasn't a fighting grin, same as Terry wears. It was just a calm, steady, business-like proposition. One of the kind that goes with a, sorry to trouble you, but I gotta knock your block off. Now I can grin, too, until I makes up my mind that it's time to pull the other chap's cork. But I was never up against any of this polite business before. It wins me, though. Right there, I says to myself, Jarvis, if you can keep that up for two rounds more, you're welcome to win out. It was worth the money. And just as I get this notion in my nut, he cuts loose with a bunch of rapid-fire jabs that had me wondering where I'd be if one landed just right. I ain't got it mapped out yet just how it happened, for about then the ladies let go a lot of squeals. But I remember stopping a facer that showed me pinwheels, and then I quits fancy boxing. We was roughing it all over the ring, and Swifty and Gorilla was yelling things, and Slattery was yelling back at him, and the muss was as pretty as any ten dollar a head crowd ever paid to see, when all of a sudden Jarvis misses a swing, and I throws all I had into an uppercut. It connected with his chin dimple like a hammer on a nut. The next thing I knows, Swifty has the elbow lock on me from behind, and Mike is standing over Mr. Jarvis making the count. Well, there wasn't any cheering and shouting. I didn't have to shake hands with any crazy bunch or be toted off to the dressing room on their shoulders. When I get so I can look straight, I sees Mother keeled over in a chair and Sister fanning her with the chocolate box. And say, I felt like a lead quarter. Next I takes a squint at Lady Evelyn. She was standing up as stiff as a tin soldier on parade, with her eyes snapping and her fingers clenched. Just one of them looks was enough for me. I gets busy with the pail and goes to work on Jarvis. He was clean out, of course, but resting as easy as a baby. We was bringing him around all right when I feels a push that shoves me to one side and in rushes Lady Evelyn. She gets one arm under his neck just as he opens his eyes with that kind of a what's-the-matter-now way they has of coming back. Of course, it don't last long, that whizzy feeling, and there ain't any hurt to speak of afterward, but I reckon Lady Evelyn don't know much about knockouts. The way she hugs him up, you thought he'd been half killed. We was all looking foolish and useless, I guess, when the lady turns to me and snaps out, Brute, I hope you're satisfied. Say, it wouldn't have been worse if I'd have been caught robbing a poor box. Thank you, ma'am, says I, and fades into the background. Go away, all of you, says she. So Swifty and the other two comes tagging along behind and we had a little reunion in the dressing room. On the dead now, says Slattery. What was the foul? Who's claiming foul, says Swifty, bristling. Why, the lady gives it to Shorty straight, says he. Ah, go dream about it, says Swifty. She don't know a foul from a body wallop. See here, says I. You can talk all that over while you're hoofing it back to the station, and you'll do to be on your way in just four minutes by the clock, so chuck it. I ain't heard no step lively call, said Slattery. Besides, I like the place. Well, it don't like you, says I. Mr. Jarvis and me have had enough of your roughhouse society to last us a time and a half. Now, Bunky Doodle. They was a sorehead trio for fair after that, but when I'd paid them off with a fiver extra for luck, they drops out of a window onto the lawn and pikes off like a squad of jailbreakers. I was some easier in my mind then, but I wasn't joyful at that. You see, Mr. Jarvis had treated me so white, and he was such a nice, decent chap, that I was feeling mighty cut up about giving him the quick exit right before the goyle he was gone on. Sure, he'd played for it, but I could see I shouldn't have done it. Knockouts ain't in my line any more, anyway. But the spring one right before women folks, and in a swell joint like Blenmont, say, it made me feel like a last year's straw hat on the first day of June. Shorty, says I, you're a throwback. You better quit traveling with real gents and commence eating with your knife again. Here's Mr. Jarvis gets you to help him out in a little society affair 
and you overdoes it so bad he can't square himself in a hundred years. Back to the junction for yours. Well, I was that grouchy I wouldn't look at myself in the glass. But I rubs down and gets into my Rialto wardrobe that I brought along in a suitcase. Then I waits for Jarvis. Oh, I didn't want to see him, but it was up to me to say my little piece. It was near an hour before he shows up wearing his bathrobe and looking as gay as a flower shop window. On the level now, says I, before he had a show to make any play at me. If I'd known what a pinhead I was, I'd stayed in the cushion. How bad did I queer you? Shorty, says he, shoving out his hand, you're a brick. And cracked in the bacon, eh, says I. But you don't understand, says he. She's mine, Shorty, the Lady Evelyn. She promised to marry me. Serves you right, says I, as we shakes hands. But how does she allow to get back at me? Oh, she knows all about everything now, says Jarvis, and she wants to apologize. Say, he wasn't stringing me either. Blow me if she didn't. And sister? You're horrid, says she. Perfectly horrid. So there. Now can you beat em? But as I've said before, when it comes to figuring on what women or horses'll do, I'm a four-flusher. End of chapter 6